I really think that uh, the Lord deserves a great applause. Amen. Let's get right into it. We're going to uh, Hebrews chapter 12. And while you're turning, well, nobody turns anymore. We welcome uh, Lake Park and Wilmington and everybody who's watching on the Internet right now. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12. Read with me. See that you do not refuse him who speaks. For if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he has promised, saying, yet once more I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. Now this, yet once more, indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken, as of things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. I pray that you will receive this as the word of the Lord today and not the word of a man. You may be seated. Well, I'm uh, once again fascinated at how many times the word shake or shaken is used there. And we're simply being told that we are at the time when a shaking is taking place. It's a small vibration right now, but it's going to turn into a full-blown shaking. Everything that is not of God is going to be shaken loose. It's like someone taking a rug outside and shaking it violently to get that which has accumulated on it off. It's like a a puppy dog with a toy shaking it. The Bible says that God is going to do the shaking. And I don't know if you sense it, but I feel the shaking beginning. And it will begin for us in odd places. It will begin in our family. And it will begin in our church. You know, Jesus said in Matthew, I think I told him to put up Matthew 3.10. I hope I did. Matthew 3 and 10 are... 1034. <laughs> Listen to this. Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. Just look at me for a moment. You know, every year, October through December now, peace on earth, goodwill towards men, prince of peace, and all that. Look at this. Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. How odd, how strange is that? Why do we never hear that preached? I did not come to bring peace on the earth. I've come to bring a sword, and I'm going to start dividing It will even go as deeply as the family. Within families, those that believe on me will be separated from those who do not. Those who won't believe, those who will not trust will find themselves leaving the family members that do. That's why we experience trouble in our families, ladies and gentlemen. It's not just that people are aggravating or or they're irritated. It's the Spirit of God doing a shaking and a dividing. The dividing, the shaking will also come to the church. It's got to start here. Peter says it like this. 
For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. What kind of judgment? What's wrong with the house of God? Well, you have too many people playing Christian. You have too much hypocrisy, too much fundraising, too much entertainment, too much showmanship, too much self, too much personality, not enough praying, not enough seeking God, not enough crying out for holiness and separation from the world, not enough of the Holy Spirit infusing people so that they live right. <laughs> Church is not about having the best and the sweetest and the biggest and the prettiest. Church is where God's people come together and die again at the foot of the cross. It's where we come and recognize only one personality. It's where we come together and are reminded we're only here temporarily and it's time for us to be serious about eternity. Amen. Judgment's going to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Brothers and sisters, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? If the righteous are with great difficulty saved, anybody going through any difficulty right now? I thank God for what he did for me on Calvary, but brother, it's been a battle every day of my life. And I will tell you, the battle is intensifying. If you're just new to the faith, it won't get any easier. It won't get any better. You've got to fight and pray and believe and deny the flesh and walk with Christ every day of your life until Jesus calls you home. So here's where we are with this. The shaking. And he's constantly telling us, don't refuse him who's talking. Listen to what God is saying. That's why I said initially, don't take this as the word of a man, but this is the word of God. Here it is the word of God. Don't refuse it. Whatever condition you're in, where, whatever the level you are spiritually, hear the word of the Lord. For if they did not escape who listened to Moses when they disobeyed, Neither will we escape if we disregard what God is saying. Now, that's an odd word there, escape. It's talking about getting away from something, being delivered from something. If you go to Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, you'll read it like this. Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard. Listen, church, the more earnest heed, the more familiar you are with the Bible doesn't mean you take it more comfortably. It's a more earnest heed. Listen to it as you've never listened to it before. Regard it highly as the Word of God because if we don't, we will drift away. That's just the way it is. Next verse says, For if the Word spoken through angels proved steadfast. And every transgression and disobedience received a just reward. How shall we escape? There's that word again. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him? Here's the question. If we neglect God's word... If we, we disregard the preaching of the word, we begin to drift. And how shall we escape if we neglect this great salvation? I have to tell you again, he's writing to believers in this book. Folks, the Bible is never written to sinners. It's always written to believers. And he is saying to me, and it alerts me, if I disregard the preaching of the word, the instruction of the scripture, how can I expect to escape what's coming on this earth? Then you go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 
But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. Times and seasons. That's, you see, God expects us to know what time it is. He expects us by virtue of the Holy Spirit teaching us to see where we are in this world. I don't know exactly when Jesus is coming back. I heard someone say it like this. You, you take a woman who is nine months along. I can't tell you the, the day or the hour, but I know the time and the season. It's going to happen. The evidence of it is everywhere. Again, I don't know the day or the hour, but I know the time and the season. And that's what God's teaching us through His Word. All you have to do is look around and see the times and the seasons. The world has gone crazy. It's coming unraveled. We're going to have another financial crisis here not, not many days hence. There's going to be another moral crisis in this country. Watch out for it. Don't be surprised when it comes. I'm telling you this world is losing its mind. There's not much left to keep it straight. Only the church in the world is keeping darkness from closing in. Do you hear what I'm saying? I don't know exactly when he's coming back, but I feel the shaking, and I sense the judgment in the house of God, and I feel something going on in the world, and I have spiritual eyes, and I can tell you it's got to be soon, brother. It's sooner than you think it is, my friend. Jesus is coming again. Then you look at Luke chapter 21. This is Jesus talking to the disciples. He's addressing Israel. But these very words are applicable to us. Take heed to yourselves. Lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing and drunkenness and cares of this life that that day come on you unexpectedly for it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the son of man Stephen, take me back to the first part of that verse again, verse 34. Take heed to yourselves. I'm just going to preach to you, all right? We have a problem in the church. And the problem is that people have become so familiar with Christ and comfortable with God that they no longer fear God. Romans says that one of the aspects of a wicked society is that there is no fear of God before their eyes. Talking about God doesn't make anybody tremble. Talking of judgment, even of hell and condemnation, makes people smirk. They don't believe in hell anymore because many churches don't preach it anymore. There is no fear in the heart and mind of the world especially, but that fearlessness has seeped into the church of the living God so that people no longer tremble when they hear the word of God. They no longer regard the sanctuary as a place where God meets with, with his people. And that's one of the reasons several weeks ago I said no more food and no more drink in this sanctuary because I could tell we're losing something around here. I could tell that we're becoming more um, seeker-sensitive than I ever want to be. We're becoming more concerned about people being comfortable in the house of God than we are being convicted in the house of God. And it hit me one day, I, I had to fall down before God and repent and ask Him, what was I thinking? <laughs> what was I thinking? A coffee shop? Yeah, we have parties. They have wedding receptions. Uh, people have fellowship. After this service, all kinds of people will gather in there and drink coffee and eat whatever they eat. But that is supposed to be 
totally separated from what's going on in these walls that we call the sanctuary of the Most High God. We are not coming in. We are never to come in here to be entertained or to just enjoy what's going on. We come into this place to commune with Almighty God, to have the Holy Spirit speak and convict and correct and guide and fill us up. We are never to make this like a living room, much less a dining room. Brother, this is a bedroom where God and his people have intimacy like this world will never know. We've lost our fear of God. When preachers have to wear tore up jeans to be relevant, you've lost your fear of God. When people have to have a band and smoke and you have to turn the lights out to have church, you've lost your fear of God. I say if it's, if it's really a church and you're really a preacher, dress up like a president. Turn on the lights in the house of God. Let everybody see what's going on. There's nothing secret that ought to be done in the house of God. We ought to shout out loud. We ought to not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We ought to represent Christ to this world. This is not just a sanctified rock band up here. These are sanctified and anointed psalmists of the most high God. See, some people found out that in Christ you're free. So now they can't con control their drinking. They were told all their life it's a sin. But then they found out that in Jesus Christ it's, it's moderation that Christ calls for, but not many people can be moderate. And that's why Jesus said those words, take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness. But I'm still a Christian. I'm not going to argue with you about any of that. I'm going to tell you that anytime you can't control anything, it's an addiction. And the Bible tells us not to be controlled by anything except the Holy Spirit. And I'm telling you that when you start enjoying and start dabbling in things you couldn't do as a child or a younger person, and now that has become more important to you than seeking the face of God, you've missed the whole point of Christian liberty. Christian liberty is not so you can carouse and indulge in drunkenness and get weighed down with the cares of this life. He set you free so you wouldn't be under the bondage of religion and be scared and guilty all the time. And that's why he said, stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has made you free and don't become engaged or entangled in a yoke of bondage again. He got you out of bondage, don't go back into it. He set you free from chains, don't go chain yourself up again. And he's warning them, warning us, that that day can come on you unexpectedly. Again, I don't know the day or the hour I have no idea but he goes on to say it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth a snare a trap that day what is that day keep going watch therefore a child of God ought to be watching all the time and pray. A child of God ought to be watching and praying. Always. That you may be counted worthy to escape 
all these things that will come to pass. Escape. That's that word again. And to stand before the Son of Man. Folks, he's talking about the rapture of the church. Because when he appears in the clouds and I'm called home or called to him, I will stand before him. Now, while it is not preached very much anymore, and many ministers and church leaders now deny it, I am preaching it and I'm not denying it. I believe in the rapture of the church. I don't teach it because it was taught to me and is a tradition to me. I taught it because on my knees in this book, I studied it and came to the conclusion that Jesus Christ is going to come back in the clouds, not back to the earth at this time, but he's going to come back and stand on the clouds and with a shout and with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God. Not one of those trumpets in Revelation. No, that's totally different. But the trump of God was the one they used in Israel when it was lifted and blasted and it was calling the people to a meeting, calling them to gather at the foot of the mountain to hear the word of the Lord. That's what I believe. And I'm telling you, again, I keep my finger on the pulse of what's being taught and what's popular to teach. And not many ministers are teaching it. Many of them are denying it, which is exactly what Satan would want. And it also shows that Christians in America are biblically illiterate. I don't know why you'll just believe everything any minister tells you. Why don't you just get on your knees with your Bible and ask the Holy Spirit to teach you? He will. You don't have to depend on me. You don't have to depend on your favorite TV guy or gal. They could be heretics. But if you don't know the Scripture, you don't know that they're heretics. But Jesus is telling us as forcefully as he can, something is going to happen. And if you want to escape what's going to happen, you need to be watching and praying. He Hebrew says if you want to escape, you need to be heeding the word of the Lord. The Bible is telling us that something very terrible is coming to this world. The end of all things is going to take place. A man of sin is going to rise up he will deceive the whole world with signs and miracles. He will control government and economy and religion. He will have a, an assistant who is a false prophet who will be able to call down fire from heaven and will deceive the nations. And that man of sin, that antichrist, will require in order for anyone to buy or sell or in fact exist in that society, they must take a mark on their hand or their head or their forehead. And when you take that mark, you are damned for eternity. And some say, well, I may not make the rapture, but I won't take the mark. Let me tell you something. If you can't live for Jesus now, in the age of grace when the Holy Spirit is out, poured out, if you can't live for Him in the church age, where every time you turn around, the grace of God is flowing and the ministry is pulling you, if you can't live now, you won't live for Him then. I'm preaching to somebody here today. I don't understand why people take a chance. Why are our children taking a chance? Why are our church members gambling? Where is the sold out believer? What happened to the people that will cry out, take the whole world, but give me Jesus? 
Where are the people who are sick of the systems and cry within, even so come, Lord Jesus. Take us home today, Lord Jesus. Where are those Christians who pray, who intercede, rather than trying to find a counseling center for the children to go to? What happened to the intercessory prayer where they crawl in and say, God, and they pour their soul out for that person? instead of trying to get some counseling. Where's the brokenness, the desperation? If you've got somebody that's lost, you've got a God that can hear and answer prayer. You have power when you pray. Oh, my hallelujah. You, you can pray and God will hear you. I feel the Spirit on me now. Folks, we don't utilize the power of prayer. Let me tell you something. When you get down and pray until the Spirit starts praying through you, you have pierced through the heavens. You have walked straight into the throne room. You have driven devils aside. There's not a force or a power that can hinder that prayer. And God answers that kind of prayer. I want to know where the crying mothers are. Where are the bemoaning fathers? Where is the church leadership that will come and lay before God and say we need a revival in our church. We look more like the world than we do the church. God, send revival. God, send the Holy Spirit. God, fill us up with the Holy Spirit. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. What are we doing? I, I, for 41 years, all we've done is try to get programs together. Oh, a program for this addiction and a program for that ailment and a program for that problem. Oh, we've got programs for divorcees and we've got programs for uh, drug addicts and we've got programs for People coming out and people, oh, it just goes on and on. It just amazes me that if you study our history in the book of Acts, they only had one program. Yes. <laughs> yes, sir. It was called prayer meeting. Yes, sir. So Peter goes to jail. Ain't no way to get him out. But the church went to prayer and an angel showed up. And unlocked the prison doors and his chains fell off. And Peter walked and knocked on the door. They were praying and didn't even believe God could answer prayer as quick as he did. Where are those kinds of prayers? Where are the brokenness or is the brokenness? What's wrong with us breaking out here today in a prayer meeting? Why does everything have to be on a schedule? Why does everybody have to be proper? I know sometimes people get out of order. And when you get out of order and start distracting and, and uh, everybody's looking at you, something's not right with that. But at some point, all of us ought to get out of order. And all of us at one time ought to say, I don't care what she thinks. I don't care what he thinks. I need God. I need a miracle. I need a touch from heaven. i got to have a move of God in my life. Why can't we do that one time somewhere? How many of you have lost loved ones? You do? How many of you are in a dire situation about something? Slip your hand up. Can God do it? Yes. I'm not finished with my message. I don't even know where I'm going now. I've just come apart. It's like everything inside of me has just come apart. And I just want God to move. I just want the Holy Spirit to have the freedom today to do something for somebody. I just wish for one time we'd forget where we are and instead of worrying about letting somebody see us raise our hands or move, we would just recognize that we're in the presence of Almighty God. The miracle working power of God is present among us. There's power here to heal. There's power here to deliver. And if we are people who are escaping the, 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 the trouble that's coming, if we are people that are watching and waiting and praying and believing, 
If we're living on the edge of that, we ought to be able to get a prayer through to God this day about a problem in somebody's life. Can I get an amen on that? Stand up with me, please. I'll have to do better the next service, but right now I'm just tore up inside. I'm tired of watching people live defeated. I'm tired. You can get a victory. You didn't hear what? You can get a victory. I believe you can get a touch from God that makes you know He heard you. He's taken care of it this very day. I believe that. But now, how many of you would, would want to actually act out what I've been talking about here? Would you come down and join me? We don't have much time, you see. I know some people who are going to hell. Jesus died for them. I know some people who are living in hell and they can't help themselves. If you're visiting with us, God bless you, come again. But we are a spirit-filled church. Yes, sir. Hallelujah. I do not make an apology for it. Hallelujah. Thank you, Pastor. And I'm going to take the next few moments and I'm going to cry out to God. Whether you stay or not is irrelevant to me. But i got to cry out to God about some things around here. Number one, I've got some backsliding church members. I've got some torn up families in this house. I've got the devil ravaging people in my ministry right here. I can't let this go on, ladies and gentlemen. Can I get somebody to join up with me here? Why can't we ask God to send a move of the Holy Spirit? the convicting power of the Holy Spirit, the life-changing power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Will you do it with me? Can I get you to cry out to God? I'm not asking you to whisper and moan. Can we cry out to God this morning? Save our children, Lord. Save our children, Lord. We don't know how they got in this shape. Save our children, Lord. We're not trying to find out how they got in this shape. Save our children, Lord. Open their eyes now. Make them miserable in their sins now. Make them remember messages and warnings they've heard now.
strike the fear of God in them now. Don't let them be comfortable in their iniquity, oh Lord. Let something happen, oh God, that would stir them so deeply and frighten them so forcefully that they would cry out, cry out to you, Jesus. Save our children, Lord. Reach way out where they are and draw them back, oh God. Lord, they think they're enjoying life. Show them how miserable they are, oh God. I'm asking you to destroy everything that they put confidence in, oh God. Everything that's been fun, make it miserable. Jerk out everything from under them so that nothing is left except the knowledge of the Lord. Take people out of their lives. Take a job away from them. If you have to make them sick, Whatever you have to do, Lord, to get them right with you, I'm calling out. Save our children, oh God. Save our families. Save our families, Lord. Lord, we're so lost, so carnal. We've watched so much reality TV, we don't even know what's real anymore. We've gone after gold and silver and money and things so, so much we don't even know what it is to go after you anymore. We've gotten so adjusted to being miserable in this world, we've forgotten how joy used to run over in our souls when we were seeking you. Save our children, oh God. Save our families. Send revival to our church. Stop all the spectatorship we've got here. Stop all the people that want entertainment. Let people be broken and humbled. Let us fall down before you and repent of our sins. Forgive us for taking you for granted. Forgive us for being comfortable with a lukewarm lifestyle. Turn us on again, Lord. Fire us up. Fill us up, Jesus. I don't believe for a moment, Lord, you want us to stand here and watch our children be torn up by the devil in the world. I just don't believe it. Therefore, I'm going to cry out to you one more time. Jesus, save our children. Jesus, save our children. And help us to remember, Lord, we don't know when the rapture is about to take place. This is urgent business. This is serious, Lord. And now I'm going to thank you. You heard us. And you want me to remind the people, stay at it. Stay on your knees. Follow after Christ. Follow on to know the Lord. Seek the Lord and His strength. And they will not be disappointed. Jesus mighty name. Ah, Jesus mighty name.
Yes. Thus says the Lord. Amen. Wait, don't, don't clap. We just heard from the Lord. It was a confirmation of this book. God's as sad as you are about this. And he's telling you, it's time for us to do what we're called to do. And that is be relentless in our pursuit of God and to see the salvation of our homes. I can't dismiss this. We just need to go our way and live this life. Amen. Pray without ceasing. Watch, for you do not know when your Lord is coming. God is good, though. Yes. And just as surely as you draw nigh to God, God will draw nigh to you. Amen. Everybody said amen. amen. See you Wednesday night for Bible study. Yes, Unless the Lord comes. <laughs>